A tap on his shoulder sends adrenaline coursing through his veins. It's time to breach. All right, y'all, welcome back to Combat Arm Channel. Okay, so today we're checking out another video from the Armchair Historian. Now this one is about a pretty cool topic. So today we're talking about the Battle of Fallujah. Now I know a little bit about the Battle of Fallujah because when I got into the Marines, a lot of my seniors had actually been through the Battle of Fallujah, which is like pretty crazy to hear about because it sounds just absolutely, it sounded pretty brutal. Now I know it happened in 2004 in Iraq, of course, and I think there were like, there were like two stages. I'm not sure how far apart you know, Fallujah 1 and Fallujah 2 were to be exact, but hopefully this video can shed light on it. It is 21 minutes long, so I feel like it's going to be able to cover it pretty comprehensively. But it definitely seems like a fascinating topic. And again, if you guys have something to add or your own personal experiences, please throw them down below because they'd be pretty cool to hear. We've just added two new posters to our store over at store.armchairhistory.tv. I didn't even know they had a, a store. That's kind of cool. I do like the artwork though. The Pointman studies Oh, nice. Again. Okay, hold on. You guys. Oh, okay. You might be asking why I have this with me right now. And honestly, I just got this. So, you know, whenever you get a new gun, you kind of just have it like by your side for like a few days. And I need to break it out because I see it in the video, which is pretty cool. So this is... So actually it's not accurate. So you can see here the mag tube is like crimped like mine is. Now the actual military M1014, the one that will actually get issued, doesn't actually have this. It's just like completely straight because it, it has more capacity for like more shells. But I'm glad they actually put it in the video because that's pretty cool to see. It does look really sick. So this is the Benelli M1014, which is a combat shotgun that was used uh, primarily by the U.S. Marine Corps. I'm not sure how much of the U.S. Army was actually utilizing this, but in Fallujah, I know these things were putting in work. From what I heard, they were putting in some pretty serious work. So yeah, it's definitely a, a beast of a gun, and it's probably pretty formidable in these CQB environments. All right, 13 seconds in, and I'm already pausing it too much. Against the door frame, the sounds of artillery and gunfire are everywhere, drowning out his thoughts. Hmm. A tap on his shoulder sends adrenaline coursing through his veins. Yeah, it's real. time to breach. Inside the concrete house, an insurgent keeps to the shadows. Whoa, this is twice getting real. in his lifetime, the Americans have come to his country, mm. and twice his people have had to endure bitter defeat. This time will be different. He pulls a grenade from his belt. Bro. The pointman racks his shotgun. The insurgent pulls his pin. The Marine takes a breath. The insurgent touches a photo. Both men pray before the door is blasted open. What the heck? They're making this really dramatic, but I, I kind of like this as an introduction. You're like really getting to the mindset of what was going through the mind of everybody who's going through this, this sort of battle. Yeah, being the point man must have been pretty terrifying in Fallujah. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Hello. Historian. The Second Battle of Fallujah in November 2004 is one of the most yeah. notorious so the of the second war battle in, in Iraq. November it was a bloody slog of urban warfare, during which US, British, and Iraqi forces attempted to drive out Islamist insurgents I didn't even know the under the leadership of Abu Musab al zarqawi a Jordanian jihadist known for masterminding a series of terrorist attacks. Hmm. Fallujah marked a turning point in the war. It was the first major battle to be fought entirely against insurgents rather than loyalists of Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party. Uh -huh, okay. Although ultimately hmm. a victory for the US and its allies, this fearic triumph came at the cost of many civilian lives and failed to break the back of the insurgency, which would continue. Yeah, for sure, civilians, but also, you know, the Marines and soldiers and everyone who was involved in actually trying to combat the insurgents. Continue to thrive in the region. In today's episode, we'll examine how this brutal house by house battle unfolded and how right. it set the stage for conflict that raged on for years to come. Let's do it. I'm excited. When settling down to relax and watch a long history documentary, oh, okay. it's always nice to taste educational yep. selection palette and take Get a that ad money. Good stuff. 
U.S. forces had tried to take control of Fallujah once before, in April of 2004, following okay, the murder April. of four American private military contractors. That operation, known as Vigilant Resolve, ended with a U.S. withdrawal and an agreement that the local population would keep the insurgency out of the city. But instead, Fallujah would become a significant stronghold for insurgents such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Army in Iraq, among hmm. others. Okay. As the number of insurgents swelled, American concern grew to match, and by September, U.S. commanders were planning a military operation to Phantom seize Fury. control of the city, Hell yeah. Operation Phantom Fury. Mm -hmm. The primary motivation was to provide security for Iraq's first elections of the post-Saddam era. But mm. another important strategic objective was the capture of Zarqawi, who was believed by the U.S. to be holed up in Fallujah. All right, so let's you check out these units real quick. So, 3-1, cav 3-8, okay, 8th Marines, hell yeah. 1-3, and then 2-2 two, two Infantry. 2-2, two, two, actually, I didn't know 2-2 two, two was involved with this. If that's the same 2-2 two, two I'm thinking of, then they're currently stationed at Fort Polk, because I was in 230, and then there we also had 2-2 two, two, and 2-4, two, so kind of cool. We're seeing some pretty familiar faces here. Ja. U.S. forces had kept a tight hold on Fallujah's surroundings. They maintained checkpoints on all roads leading out of the city and seized any Iraqi police and National Guard vehicles attempting to leave. Hmm. During the night, AC-130 gunships oh, destroyed man. every vehicle spotted with a weapon and conducted frequent <laughs> bombardments of any house suspected to be harboring insurgents. Oh damn, the it was freaking weapons free then. Recognizing the costly signs of an imminent American assault fled the city in droves. Hmm. Many neighborhoods were totally abandoned, including Fallujah's southern district dubbed Queens by U.S. soldiers. <laughs> by October, reconnaissance flights showed empty- Yeah, imagine that nickname wasn't meant to be flattering, but yeah, from what I've heard and from what I've seen, Fallujah was like pretty well built up, so it must have been really difficult, especially people who didn't really get like really good like room clearing or CQB training, having to go into like this whole built up urban area with very minimal training would be pretty scary. Clotheslines and abandoned streets. Indeed, the civilian population was estimated to have fallen from around 280,000 to as little Whoa. as 30,000. These Dang, empty neighborhoods people, were swiftly filled by more than 3,000 insurgents who took to operating in small 3, groups of between four and 20 fighters amid the abandoned homes. Wow. These dispersed groups were able to weather the American bombardment in Fallujah's resilient cement houses. That's terrifying. Unable to blast them from their shelters, the Americans would have to clear them out room by room. Good grief. It would be a hard fight to even get to that point. Hmm. Since April, the insurgents' numbers had doubled as they drew in combatants from virtually every armed group in Iraq. Oh yeah. Trenches were dug. Broke. I do remember hearing about that, especially like the the Chechenian snipers from what I heard were like insane and very very formidable when it came to these sorts of built up areas. It's blocked with concrete barriers or collections of cars and trucks, jury rigged emplacements of earthworks and sandbags prepared. Hmm. The insurgents had even managed to capture some weaponry from coalition forces. Among the most effective defenses, however, were the improvised explosive devices, yep. or IEDs, with which the insurgents riddled the city. Yeah, vehicles at the time weren't meant Fallujah to, to handle those. Fallujah was covered in booby traps buried under the streets, taped to the side of telephone poles, and hidden in rubble, abandoned vehicles, or empty houses, Good ready grief. to explode the moment a Marine passed by. Hmm. Marine Expeditionary Force planners knew they would be walking into an enormous urban death trap. But the Americans had their own advantages. Okay. Most notably, their large force of professional and experienced soldiers. Oh, yeah. For Operation Phantom Fury, Commanding Officer Major General Richard Natansky believed it important to attack Fallujah with as much strength as possible. 
his forces, reinforced by two U.S. armored battalions and a U.S. Army armored brigade, consisted of oh, yeah. 10,500 Marines who would be fighting alongside 2,000 troops from the recently established Jeez. Iraqi security forces 10, and 150 Marines, soldiers man. from the famous Scottish Black Watch Battalion oh, from the nice. British Armed Forces. Hell yeah, dude. This coalition vastly outnumbered the insurgents. The Americans also had the advantage of formidable air power, with mm. AC-130 gunships on hand to provide close air support during the fighting. Yeah, no kidding. However, these aircraft would only operate at night for fear of being targeted by surface-to-air missiles. This yeah. caused serious consternation. I don't know exactly what sort of equipment the insurgents had. It seemed like they were like relatively well armed, but as far as like surface to air missiles, I imagine they had a few in their arsenal. So the threat was probably pretty real. So I imagine they took that pretty credibly. So they weren't trying to fly during the day and just make it more of a risk than they needed to. But yeah, just that, that sort of threat looming in the back of your mind, especially being a pilot here must have been kind of scary as well. But I mean, these things are definitely putting in work, so I'm sure it was scaring a lot more people on the receiving end of this thing. ...among commanders on the ground, with one officer remarking they would be fighting with one hand tied behind our backs. Nevertheless, mm. their presence was a major boon to the U.S. during the brutal urban warfare that was to come. No Understanding the scale of the challenge ahead of them, American planners worked to ensure there would be no logistical disruptions during the battle, fearing possible attacks on convoys along the highway that could delay shipments and cause shortages. A vast excess of fuel, ammunition, and supplies would be sent to the forces around Fallujah to prevent any need for risky resupply. Nice. That's good planning. Major General good Natansky stuff. divided the city into two halves and assigned to each a regimental combat team made up of mostly regimental U.S. Marines and reinforced team. by an Army armored battalion. Sheesh. These were RCT-1 and RCT-7, built That's around sick. the 1st and 7th Marine regiments, respectively. Hmm. Each was hidden behind a large railway berm to the north of the city, which they would have to break through to begin the assault. No kidding. Our yeah, nowadays seeing a Marine regimental combat team is pretty much unheard of, because normally right now it's just the, the MU, the Marine Expeditionary Unit, which has a battalion landing team. So it's just an infantry battalion that's being utilized as a sort of assault force. But a regimental combat team is pretty insane to think of nowadays. T1 would provide the main thrust of the attack, entering the city from the north, which was less heavily defended than the city's southern and eastern entrances. Mm. In order to lend an element of surprise to the attack, some elements of RCT1 would launch diversionary attacks in oh, the nice. south. Meanwhile, RCT7 oh, yeah. would advance from the northeast to support the main assault. Its primary objectives were to ensure the Jolan district, where the insurgent forces were thought to be the most concentrated, and seize control of the Makadi Mosque, which housed the enemy headquarters. Hmm. Heavy army task force- uh, Of course they put the headquarters in there. I don't know what the rules of engagement were for the mosque at this point, but from what I heard, it was getting pretty difficult to have to work around. Because obviously you don't want to be firing on these religious sites, but when the enemy was using them so often, I don't know. I imagine the rules of engagement engagement shifted a little bit towards like the end when they were just realizing like they can't avoid it at this point. But maybe they'll talk a little bit more about that. ...would lead the way on both thrusts, driving as rapidly as possible toward the city center while the Marines took on the difficult task of house to house clearing in their wake. Meanwhile, the Black Watch would maintain the perimeter around Fallujah and prevent other insurgent forces from cutting the city off. Good stuff. Finally, oh, yeah. three battalions of relatively well-trained but poorly equipped Iraqi security forces were brought in to support the Americans and provide peacekeeping after the battle. All right. The battle began in the ER. On the night of November 7th, the Iraqi 36th Commando Battalion and their U.S. Army Special Forces advisors captured Fallujah General Hospital nice. and several minor targets in the west and the south, seeking to distract and confuse enemy combatants. 
They were watched closely by Marines 10 miles away through the infrared camera of a Pioneer unmanned aerial vehicle yeah. who relayed their observations to the forces on the ground via radio. That must have been crazy to watch. Two from, like, other the, UAVs the were surveying the city that night, seeking out the dark outlines of insurgents clustering in place or manning a heavy weapon. Oh, These man, positions okay. would be relayed to Basher, the codename given to the AC-130 gunships yeah. waiting to unleash their deadly payload of 105 millimeter artillery shells. Yep, good stuff. The call sign is pretty fitting too. These attacks meant certain doom for their targets. The only escape was to take shelter in a mosque. Targeting a religious building is a war crime, making mosques guaranteed protection from aerial bombardment. <laughs> Fallujah, known as the city of mosques, had 200 of these to choose from. My mosques gosh, were also 200. reported to house significant amounts of armaments, making them extremely useful locations My for gosh. insurgent forces. Hmm. That's not fair. <laughs> the diversion Jeez. was successful, securing the peninsula west of the city and the two bridges across the Euphrates River, allowing the regimental combat teams to prepare for the main assault to begin the following day. All right. The daylight hours were spent striking key targets with artillery, unmanned predator drones, and guided bomb units to soften up the city's defenses. After dark, the Marines began their attack along the northern edge of the city Damn, with the support from tanks and artillery. They first captured the railway station before advancing into the city proper, entering mm. the Haynab al Dabat and al Maziza gosh, districts by the afternoon of the 8th. These animations really help to get like, I'm not sure, of course it's not going to look exactly like this, but to be able to sort of see the layout of the roads and whatnot, it just looks like a spider web of roads and crazy buildings and compounds like just trying to organize just the the flow of people must have been extremely difficult so you're like okay you cleared up to this building hold here until these guys can push up so you're not just getting like a weird shape of formation and getting like possibly flanked or what have you the night was cold with intermittent rain showers but the marine's Clearly, path damn. was regularly lit by the detonation of dozens of rockets and mortars from the insurgents <laughs> as well as oh, man. artillery okay. mortar and aircraft fire from the americans themselves hmm. however some units struggled to break through the railway berm and were stuck for hours as engineers attempted to blast through amid withering fire and no rain. kidding the Damn, coalition forces sight. made significant progress during the night, but when sun rose on November 9th, the momentum of the battle shifted. Mm. The insurgents began to aim their mortars more precisely and effectively, and their fighters took full advantage of the dense urban landscape to whittle down their foes. Mm. Small groups of insurgents would dash through the narrow alleys, emerging briefly to fire RPG rounds at their enemies before darting away out of sight. While others thing that, used these sturdy cement buildings as pillboxes from which to the fire upon were, the approaching were really Marines. Solid at this point. The fighting They're was at its work. most brutal inside the houses. As they advanced, squads of Marines would search each home one by one, clearing them of hmm. enemy fighters in slow, exhausting urban fighting. For real. They found no combatants in most, but sometimes, without warning, they would enter a house to see grenades rolling across the floor toward them and a hail of gunfire bursting out of the shadows. Clearing a house required incredible persistence and overwhelming firepower, including the use of MK-153 rocket launchers. If even these big guns failed, the Marines would resort to smashing the windows, tossing in grenades, mm. and sending hundreds of rifle rounds into the house before... M1 frag. I'm not sure they were using M1s. They had to have had M67s at that point, surely. But okay, so yeah, the clearing houses, from what I heard, was really brutal. Even like they would set up like false walls and whatnot. So they would hide in there. They would set up machine guns. They would have kill holes. So they would literally punch a hole in the wall and put like a machine gun or, you know, shoot down through these holes. And it was, man, it just. It sounded absolutely terrifying. Of course, like they're saying, most of the buildings didn't have insurgents for sure, but that makes it even more terrifying because when you do actually come upon a building with insurgents, it's, you know, you're just trying to fight this complacency. And I'm sure they weren't really getting complacent. They definitely were well-trained enough to sort of fight that, but it still must have messed with their minds 
pretty good amount. Before bursting in to mop up any remaining foes. But this would be easier said than done. With insurgents lurking in every shadow and booby traps exploding around them, the Marines advanced through the streets of Fallujah at a snail's pace. Both sides would receive scant rest. Oh yeah, true, that must have been really, really hard to sleep. Each night, with mortar fire continuing to rain down around them, Americans did their best to hunker down inside houses hmm. and sleep. In a bid to unsettle them, the insurgents adopted unique psychological warfare tactics, huh. blasting incessant chants from loudspeakers in the city's mosques. Wow. In return, U.S. Hmm. Army Humvees roamed the streets playing everything from Guns N' Roses songs uh. to the Predator sound effect in deafening volumes. Nice, nice. Okay, it's kind of cool seeing the psychological warfare coming into play because a lot of people don't really talk about that. And there's probably not that many videos that talk about like the PSYOPs version or the PSYOPs perspective of warfare. But I'm sure the role that PSYOPs actually played in these sorts of battles was actually a lot bigger than a lot of people would consider. The next morning, the urban warfare resumed in much the same way, with brutal fighting for each and every city block. Hmm. The insurgents were relentless, but by November 11th, the northern half of Fallujah had fallen to the Americans. Okay. A day later, as US forces closed in on the insurgent headquarters, American aggression increased. It was estimated one in every 20 houses contained hostile troops, okay. compared to one in every 50 houses previously thought. Now anticipating oh, enemy fire dang. from every building, the Marines standing orders became enter every room with a boom. Oh. As the units advanced, insurgents who had slipped back behind the front line or had remained hidden emerged to trouble the rear of the advancing line. Oh, no kidding, Marines dude. had to remain behind to continually clear and re-clear houses. Damn, we spoke so to a veteran of the battle who recalls, we were afraid of doors rigged to explode since we had to go door to door and clear the buildings, and they didn't care whose house they rigged. Yeah, go figure. We had guys attempt to breach doors of regular civilian homes, and as a result of the door being rigged, it would send shrapnel and debris everywhere. That's terrifying. Nevertheless, at the end of the 12th, RCTs 1 and 7 had reached all of their major objectives, but it would take more time for the Marines to fully secure them. Often, the Americans would encounter not enemy fighters, but civilians who had failed to escape ahead of the battle. Oh my Although gosh. Although they would typically wave white flags in warning as soon as they heard the Marines approach, sometimes things did not go smoothly. Hundreds of civilians were killed over the course of this bloody house-by-house -house yeah, warfare. Sure. At Damn. some stage of the fighting, American artillery units began to employ white phosphorus, an extremely deadly incendiary Ooh. agent to root out dug-in insurgent forces. The use of this toxic, caustic chemical weapon is considered legitimate if used to illuminate a battlefield or to produce smoke, but its use against enemy personnel is a violation of international law and is a war crime. Yep. Some journalists accused the Americans of deploying white phosphorus against civilian targets, an accusation vigorously denied by the US military. It has, however, been admitted to using the weapon against enemy combatants when conventional weapons became ineffective, claiming That's to have ensured stuff. no civilians were present before using it. Actually, I remember we were doing a range at one point and we were hitting this targets with white phosphorus and then the machine gunners lit it up with their tracers and whatnot and it just, you know, set the targets on fire. That was pretty insane to see. By December 13th, the fighting had begun to slow. Fallujah was under almost total coalition control, mm. although the occupying forces still faced stiff resistance from isolated pockets of insurgents. Some of the fiercest individual fights came in the battle's closing stages, such as the so-called House of Hell, in which a Marine battalion oh. faced down a group of well-trained, fanatical Chechen fighters yeah. in a well-defended home. Around this time, humanitarian operations were allowed to begin, despite continued bouts of airstrikes. So real quick, if you guys didn't see that, so this was Sergeant Major uh, Castle Cassell. I'm not exactly sure if I'm saying his name right, but he actually retired not too long ago, a couple of years ago, he actually got out of the Marine Corps. And that dude is a badass. You, you probably have seen the picture at some point with the dude with the pistol, like all bloodied up and whatnot with the people carrying, 
yeah, it's a pretty cool picture. And having, you know, known people that have had him as a star major, it's pretty, pretty badass to think about that your star major was this dude that you always see in pictures, stuff that like motivated you to actually join and whatnot. ...were allowed to begin, despite continued bouts of airstrikes and small arms fire. Hmm. RCT-7 set up a humanitarian center at the Al Hadra Mosque, and Marines in the Jolan district arranged for local Iraqis to enter the city to recover the bodies of dead insurgents. Hmm. For the following okay. two weeks, MEF command described the ongoing operations as simply mopping up the final pockets of militants. Hmm. Sporadic combat would continue until the 23rd, after nearly a month no and a half of fighting. Jeez, Since the battle, allegations of war crimes, massacres, and human rights abuses have emerged. This has made Fallujah a focal point for opposition to the war in Iraq and across the West. Yeah, sure. I, I get it. But you have to consider what these Marines were going through. Like at that point, they're really focused on their self-preservation. Once you have the insurgents using all these mosques and rigging the doors, rigging the roads with explosives and making holes to shoot down at you. They were really focused on self-preservation at that point, especially again, they didn't necessarily have the technology they have today. They didn't have the training that they have today. So it must have been hard for them to just Think about ways to keep themselves alive while also trying to do it ethically, you know? The battle was brutal, ultimately proving to be one of the bloodiest in the entire conflict. Mm. Coalition forces suffered 720 casualties, with 107 killed and 613 wounded. Damn. Of these, 95 of those killed and 500 of those wounded were American, mm. while four British soldiers were killed guarding the highway. Deaths among the insurgents are estimated as ranging from 1,500 to 2,000 killed Holy and cow. another 1,500 captured. Fallujah's Damn. civilians suffered 800 lives lost over the course of the battle. And that's, in the years since, shady. there's been a marked rise in infant mortality, cancer, and congenital anomalies, hmm. or birth defects, a consequence the of depleted bothers? uranium exposure oh. from munitions. The city, too, huh. witnessed catastrophic destruction, with nearly one-fifth of its buildings destroyed and over half of those remaining experiencing heavy damage. Mm. Fallujah, once the city of mosques, had seen 60 of its 200 places of worship destroyed during the battle. Although the city was Makes captured, sense. the coalition had failed to land a decisive blow against the insurgents. Many of them simply slipped away into the surrounding Al Anbar province, mm. including. Yeah, fighting an insurgency was a lot bigger thing than a lot of people considered just immediately going into it. It's it's hard to sort of fight an ideology like that, if that makes any sense, especially when people don't necessarily have the same morals or ethics that you're trying to operate with. So you have things like this where they're using mosques and they're using the civilian populace to keep themselves safer. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. By 2006, the province, with the exception of the city of Fallujah, was reported to be in total insurgent control, hmm. leaving the United States with the hard task of battling them for many years to come. Yep. Again, if you guys have experienced Fallujah firsthand, or if you know anyone who has experienced it, please put it down in the comment section, because again, that would be Really awesome to hear about those sort of experiences, especially the firsthand knowledge about how it was from from what y'all saw or, you know, how it was described. It, it must be a really difficult thing to describe the Battle of Fallujah, especially since it was relatively alien as far as like, again, just the really built up urban areas, especially when you have all these insurgents and especially when you have this crazy built up area. And of course, when the insurgents are utilizing the civilians and the mosque and whatnot to try and keep themselves a little bit safer and also just dispersing in pockets here and there. It must have been really difficult to try and deal with that mentally. But of course, if you guys have anything to add, please throw it down in the comment section. Hopefully y'all enjoyed it. Again, Armchair Historian, they do some great stuff on the channel. So I will put the original video in the description. So definitely go and check out that channel because yeah, this is some, some good stuff. It's nice to sort of learn the history and it's just nice to sort of see everything animated so well because you can just 
sort of visualize it a little bit better as far as the conditions and just the overall layout of what they were dealing with. But hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel. Of course, I have merch in the video description. So if you guys want to check that out, you can do that. Or if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do that as well. I do appreciate it. Or definitely go and check out the Discord and share your stories there. Talk to other members of the community. It's a great place to check out. So thank you for watching. That's it for this video. I'll see you on the next one.